Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I hope you're well. My name is Alex, and this is Slumber Time Podcast. Before I begin today's main topic, uh, there's some really good news that uh, the Kickstarter for the Eloy book that I read at the beginning of the first podcast is going to launch on uh, Thursday night slash Friday morning, depending on where you are. So if you liked it, uh, check it out. I'll link it again below. Um, You should be able to get the book within a couple months uh, once the Kickstarter ends. But yeah, um, for the main topic today... We're going to be discussing three points related to uh, working and living abroad. So first will be advice on moving abroad. Second will be related to job hunting abroad. And third will be uh, related to the personal side of working abroad. So I'm not going to be looking at uh, any different authors like I usually do today because uh, this is probably going to take up uh, 30, 35 minutes. So... Yeah, if you're interested in working abroad, and in Japan especially, this is definitely going to be for you. Um, I think this is especially useful for high school students, college students, recent graduates who are interested in uh, getting ready to uh, start their career. Others who are interested in just going abroad at different times. So here's a quick introduction about me first. So I've been in Japan for five years one year for study abroad, and four years for work. I'm teaching at an English school in Tokyo now, but um, I also lived in Nagoya. So yeah, uh, I handle testing at work. I do some sales there as well as the teaching. And um, honestly, I was not good at all at the beginning. But I found out what I needed to do to be successful. Uh, I'll get into more of what I especially needed in part three of today's discussion though, but let's go ahead and start with my advice for moving abroad. All right, number one, uh, pretty obvious. If you get homesick easily, do not move abroad. For some, this may be your first time living more than an hour away from your parents and If you go abroad, it will make life a whole lot harder if you can't handle it. Most people who are in college now will know whether they can do it or not, um, and a study abroad will really help you figure it out as well. So I do recommend taking time, building yourself up to uh, moving abroad. Don't do it all at once because I've seen enough people I work with just go back home after a couple months. Number two really important, make sure you have enough money saved up. Depending on the country you're going to, have enough money for two or three months. This needs to include rent and food. You'll start work, and usually you won't be paid for the first month. If you start work in January, for example, you won't get paid until February. And for my work, uh, we get paid on the 25th of each month. So if I start on January 1st, I work all of January and then won't get paid until February 25th, which is basically two months without pay. Now, I've even seen some people recommend have up to six months saved up. I personally think that's going to be really difficult for the recent graduates and the college students, but um, it does make sense if something happens when you start the new job and then it will give you enough time to find a different one. I have to add on to this. One of the best pieces of advice I've heard for this, make sure you always have enough money for a ticket back home. You do not want to be stuck in another country without any way back home. And yeah, I've had some friends who are right on the edge, who never have enough money, who spend way too much. Please, please, please take care of your finances. Uh, For me, I ended up doing a summer job to get some money saved up, and I also worked uh, a decent amount of my last semester. Yeah, uh, delivering pizza is what I did, and honestly, it pays quite well. I was averaging in one city about $15 an hour. Uh, I did go to a different city, which was a little bit less, so if you're in a big city, delivering pizza is great. Number three, triple check you have all the items you need to survive. Uh, If you're in college, you probably already know what you need, but 
yeah, there are so many lists online. Make sure you have all the books you need or want, all the clothes you need or want, and toiletries. If you need them, they are expensive to ship. My parents usually spend about $60 just for shipping for a care package. You'll even have some difficulty finding things that you usually get overseas. So uh, for some friends of mine, good makeup has been difficult to find. And um, for me, it's really hard finding good deodorant. So make sure you have that saved up. Um, I know for me, I'm also wanting to find some good books, but it's kind of hard to find some English books while you're in a, a non-English speaking country. That brings me to number four. Uh, also hard to find food that you used to have back home. Bring some food you really love. If you can have like a packet form of it, buy that. I have some ranch packets, uh, some French onion packets for when I want to make those. For uh, Japan especially, ranch does not exist. So that's something I really think you should plan for. Five, also pretty obvious, try to study some of the language uh, if you are going to a non-English speaking country. So... For me, I recommend phrases, especially for shopping. Um, you'll want phrases for when you go to the grocery store and restaurants, I think, are going to be the most useful. That's probably all the Japanese I need for 90% of the situations. So those would be my top two. Number six, make sure you can get your medicine overseas. I didn't have this problem, but for some friends of mine, prescriptions can be really hard to get. And some medicine, or some of the ingredients for medicine, uh, is illegal in some places overseas. So stock up if possible before going, and make sure you find a way to get the same medicine or a substitute before you run out. Number seven, for the extroverts out there, I highly recommend using Meetup, if you haven't heard of it, of course. It's a great way to get involved in the activities you love while making friends in your new city. And there are groups for everything. You can join dancing groups, futsal, uh, if you want to just go drinking. Uh, they're always welcoming new people. You generally don't need to speak the language to get along with the people, especially if you know what you're doing. So, yeah, there's likely more that, uh, that people would recommend, but... I'm not going to uh, bog this podcast down with them. If you have some recommendations yourself from your experience, feel free to put them in the comments. I know there's quite a few more, but I'm going to go ahead and move on to part two. And this is my advice for uh, preparation to take in university and general job hunting advice. So in general, don't do what I did. I started applying for jobs in January, the year I graduated. Uh, it was not ideal time-wise, but basically I was in Japan from March to December the year before, so uh, I was just getting back from my study abroad, and uh, during which I was not thinking of much else besides the classes I was taking and partying. I went to clubs at least once a week. It, it was a ton of fun, but it made that last semester really difficult with other classes I was taking. So I would recommend first that you look into what companies or jobs you would like to apply for earlier than I did. Uh, I recommend doing that at the beginning of your senior year to give yourself a couple months of searching and then a couple months for applying and interviewing. So that way you can be proactive and uh, it'll save a lot of stress. I also highly recommend doing some work studies or internships. If your university has any, do it. For mine, it was possible to use an internship as your final credit for the major as well. So for my college, you didn't need any thesis if you did this or if you did a study abroad. So it'll give you a lot of information about whether you want to do that type of work study or internship as a career in the future. And yeah, it'll also help with your resume. Trust me, you will need everything you can get for your first resume. Most people are not going to have a 
even a decent one at this time of their life. Now, for some, you're going to be too busy during the school year, so try during the summer. Talk to the counselors at your school, talk to the chair of your department, and they'll help you find where to start. I personally didn't do that, but uh, I did have my study abroad and some part-time work in Japan, uh, helping tutor some students to help me learn that I would really enjoy, well, living here and uh, enjoy teaching. So yeah, um, similar for some of this, networking is going to be key. If you do it really well, you'll likely have a job lined up for you after college. You'll also likely receive good recommendation letters or at least some connections that will help you later on. Uh, even joining clubs in university really helped me. Personally, I joined way too many freshman year. I think I was in, involved in like eight or nine. Uh, but they were all good experiences. Uh, I chose the ones that I would stick with for the four years and generally kept with about uh, three or four. And yeah, the experiences and the connections were completely invaluable. One ended up being a recommendation letter and um, really good for my resume. Also, as a side note, if you haven't decided on the career you want, that's okay. You can change it later if you want. And to make things easier for you in the future, I do recommend studying things that are applicable for many jobs. Now, if you do know what you want, and that job is very specific, make sure you study it all now. It's going to be hard to stop life and go back to school f in the future. And uh, for me, like I had wish I had studied science with my math major so that I could be better equipped for a wide variety of jobs that need those specific skill sets. But anyway, uh, once I did start looking for jobs, I knew that I wanted to work in Japan since I had a lot of friends here. It was a big part of my life up until then. I knew that I really liked Japan from a trip I took in 2009, but that was only two weeks long. And so that's why I did my study abroad. And after that, I knew that I could live here long term without much of an issue. And yeah, uh, more importantly, for those interested in living in Japan, I do have to say the absolute easiest way into the country is by becoming a student that way you'll be able to get your student visa and once you're here it's pretty easy to go from a student visa to a work visa the other easy way is after you graduate become an english teacher uh they're always hiring that will give you your work visa and then once you're here you can search for other jobs uh while you're making money and it will make sure that you can get sponsored. So yeah, you'll have a much higher chance of getting hired for other jobs if you're already in the country. In regards to the teaching path, uh, I'll talk mostly about that for today. So I don't know much about going from a student to a work visa. So for Japan, you don't need a TEFL or TESOL certification to work here, which is a big plus. If you wanna work in other countries, do check out the criteria needed for them. For the most part, you can just get certification online for cheap. And uh, although some countries may want you to have in-person teaching experience, uh, they will be offered with many of the online courses. So check there before applying for any jobs. Now in Japan, the biggest uh, teaching schools are Eon, Berlitz, ECC, GABA, and NOVA. You can apply for the JET program or other a ALT programs to become a teacher in actual schools and uh, I leave that choice up to you but uh, the main five that I mentioned first are basically classrooms in office buildings or near train stations so do research on the ones you feel are best for you uh, for example if you don't like kids don't apply for a school called Amity which is a Eon sister company if you don't want to be alone with your client for example don't apply for GABA each one has uh, their good points and bad points, and you're going to find that most are going to be rated about the same online. So, uh, yeah, the English teaching industry in Japan, in all honesty, uh, does not really care about their employees. It's, it's kind of rough out there. Um, you're not going to have the best time with this company. It's not going to be the easiest, and yeah, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. Uh, but to save on a little bit of research in regards to these companies, uh, basically Eon, 
They're going to be for group lessons of all ages. You're going to have to teach kids and adults. Uh, they do sometimes have independent lessons, so it's uh, going to be a good mixture. GABA is going to be just one-to-one. -one. Uh, you're going to have mostly just adults and very few teenagers. So if you're not interested in teaching uh, high school, middle school, elementary school, uh, that's going to be the one for you. Berlitz is very similar to GABA, but it's more grammar focused. Um, and they do sometimes have group lessons as well, I think. Nova is going to be similar to Eon, I believe. Uh, going to be group lessons and uh, all ages. Uh, I'm less familiar with ECC, but as far as I know, it's very similar in that it's uh, group lessons and uh, going to be pretty cheap in comparison to like Berlitz or GABA. Now, uh, the main place to search for jobs is going to be gaijinpot.com. I'll, I'll link to it below if you don't know how to spell it. It's just like uh, any job posting site, but specifically for Japan, you don't have to look just for teaching jobs. They have other things. So if you want to work at a restaurant, for example, or hotels, or uh, if you're interested in engineering, that would be a good place to start. So yeah, once you do that, apply to any and all you want. Once you're accepted, they'll take you through the process of getting your visa, by sending some docu documents to the consulate near you. For me, it took from getting accepted in early May to arriving in Japan in mid-July. I then started working in early August after the initial certification, uh, got my bank account, my phone number, and apartment all set up. So yeah, uh, expect about a three-month uh, turnaround for this. So yeah, I mentioned last time that I worked in Ginza, uh, which is a high-class shopping district of Tokyo. The clients we have there are pretty strict. If you if they don't like the phrases you teach, you get in trouble. And if you look tired, you get in trouble. If you don't understand them, you get in trouble. If anything happens that the client doesn't like that is in any way related to you, you're going to get in trouble. And I don't mean just with the clients. The company is not going to protect you. And uh, only in rare circumstances will you be able to get away scot-free. But yeah, that might sound like a terrible situation to be in. And yeah, it, it sucks sometimes, but you just got to make sure that you don't let it get to you. There's ways to make it easier, and there's always some support systems. Uh, lots of people have had issues with working for those companies for expen extended periods of time. And that's just how it is. But uh, for most people, though, I will say they're going to be put in areas that are going to be more relaxing. They're going to have clients who have lower standards. So it's not going to be as bad. Ginza is considered uh, either the most difficult or the second most difficult uh, area to teach in for our school. So don't let that get to you. Uh, basically, it's really just important how important to learn how to handle people. You're going to learn that quickly uh, based off of the culture of the area you're put in. You'll learn that some clients are going to be strict. Some are going to be very forgiving. The third and final thing I'd like to discuss uh, are the top two points that helped me handle people. And I think this is perfectly applicable for absolutely any job. Uh, for me, it's confidence and psychology. All right, so I'll get into more about what I mean in regards to each, but uh, I will say that these points are focused mostly on being liked by your client, and I'd say that makes up about 70% of being a good teacher. The teaching part is something that I don't have as much to add, but yeah, make sure that your clients improve or else it's going to be really difficult for you and for other instructors in the future. I'll also add that culture is going to be a huge part of this as well. If you're not familiar with it, you're going to have a hard time. The difficulty with Japan, for example, is that the client is considered to be God. But the teachers are well respected by students in high school, elementary school. So you're going to have some students come in thinking that you have to lead. And you are in control since you're the teacher, but you're also going to have some clients who think they're 
God, because that's the culture they're used to. They're the client. It's a really tough line to toe, especially with some clients who are more in the middle. So you got to be able to balance that. Once you're hired, I recommend asking around about the difficulties from more experienced coworkers. They can give some more advice, I think, and answer any questions that are related to this. Uh, if you're not going to Japan specifically, yes, uh, they'll be able to tell you more about the culture. For me, though, I, I didn't have an issue with the culture in most cases. The early mistakes I made really led me to uh, lose trust in myself. I became uncertain, and this made me even shyer than I already was, which brings me to my first point, confidence. All right. For some, they're natural public speakers. They're able to handle persuading others to believing them either by natural charisma, confidence, passion. I will say, though, that I was never afraid of public speaking. I'm just not good with criticism. After having some clients be unhappy with how I was handling lessons, I overcorrected, ended up having situations that uh, I felt like I couldn't handle, panicked, and it just made things worse for me. So... I tended to think that every lesson was me trying to survive instead of trying to impress the client. And at our school, we can be evaluated by the clients, and they suffered from that. But, luckily, one of my bosses pulled me aside after my first six months and told me what I really needed to work on. It was basically that I wasn't confident in how I taught the clients. I didn't come across as being knowledgeable due to any uncertainty in my voice, uh, I was trying to test the waters with the client to see if what I was doing was acceptable, but that showed that I wasn't confident in what I was doing. I also needed to reduce my thinking time. I was taking too long to respond to some difficult questions from the clients, and I needed to say I don't know if I didn't know the answer. So that really helped boost my confidence and would also help save the client time and money. Another boss told me that I was really only trying to avoid the bad reviews, and I really needed to aim for getting the best reviews. And he was exactly right. So once I did that, my evaluations jumped up quite a bit. I guess in an odd way, I'm also recommending to have a good boss, or, or at least a good mentor. Find someone who's friendly and quite knowledgeable, who's willing to help you out if you have a rough time. I guess that's not really your choice there, is it? Uh, the second point I'd like to look at is client psychology. Now, this is, for me, extremely interesting, but also extremely important. One thing we often use at our school is basically we break down the personalities into four personality types, which are expressive, amiable, analytical, and driving. Now, some may have heard this from class. That's great. Uh, for me, it was completely new, though, and this is definitely an oversimplification of this theory, so do look up more online if you're interested in more, but to explain this, basically, expressive people love to talk, they're very emotionally responsive, amiable people are going to be emotionally responsive, but not so talkative. Imagine someone who's shy, for example. Uh, analyticals, they're going to be less emotionally inclined, and they're also not going to talk much. They're the thinkers, they're the ones who love detail in the lesson. Uh, the hardest for me were the drivers. They don't care about the emotional connections, they don't want that emotional rapport. They're going to be similar to the analyticals in that way, but uh, the drivers are the go-getters and the leaders. You're going to need to make sure that you're more serious at least for me, I need to be more serious in the lessons. I usually try to make jokes, and it doesn't go over well with them. Now, understanding the different personality types is step one. If you even can place the client into one of the four categories, you can go from there, but many people are going to be a mix, of course, and some people change types throughout the lesson, so you're going to have to adapt to that. Which brings me to step two, which is applying this and uh, the simple flow chart for it which i use but by no means will always work okay it will not always work basically drivers react well to analytical types analyticals react well with amiable types amiables react well with expressives and expressives react well with drivers 
for example, imagine someone who's shy, amiable. If you are cold emotionally, this is not going to warm them up to you at all. If you're also shy like them, and you're not so talkative, nobody's going to talk, and you're not going to get anywhere. Basically, the last thing that's left, being expressive. If you're expressive, you're going to be able to lead this shy person along, and you're also going to help them by warming them up with that emotional rapport. Drivers, for example, on the other side of the spectrum, don't want the emotional type so much. Two drivers, also, they're going to butt heads. You don't need two leaders in the group, but... If you can create that intellectual rapport, being more analytical with the driver, get them to think so that they have that illusion of making a decision, you've created a good environment that's going to match their personality. Those are the tactics I generally use in the lesson. It's a lot to understand at first, especially if you're not familiar with this, but this is the flowchart that really helped me understand as an analytical person myself. Again, it by no means will help with all people. But for me, at the beginning, I was just floundering about what I could possibly be doing wrong, kept trying to make extreme choices that were not working, and now I have a list of actions that generally work with different types. But yeah, if one doesn't work, I can then move on to another tactic that generally works, and if that doesn't, then I can do another one. In that case, that's very rare, I feel. This is probably the most important rule when in a leadership position. Not just for teaching, if you want to become a manager, I think this is quite applicable. I've seen enough of my bosses treat one employee just like another without taking into account the type of person the employee is. Like, for example, some employees feel more comfortable talking privately, but others are going to feel trapped. Over time, though, these these types of ideas, this flow chart that I mentioned, uh, it's going to become more natural in your actions. You don't have to think about what kind of person likes what in most situations. I admit that if what normally works for me doesn't, I will have to think about what I can do to troubleshoot the situation. But yeah, those are my main points that I had issues with before. And if you can get the client to like you and you have no problem changing your personality to match what someone needs, good on you. You have a really high emotional intelligence and you're going to be very successful here. Uh, of course, this is not just for teaching clients, as I said, I think this is applicable to absolutely every job out there, as long as you have to work with other people. Yeah, uh, anyway, I hope that these ideas helped. It's a bit hard to cover all the advice for working and moving abroad. I included the main ones that I think will be able to help the vast majority of people. But yeah, if you enjoyed this, please let me know. If you have any specific questions about living and working in Japan, please ask. I will try to answer every comment in the comment section. If you have any advice as well, please give that. If you're on Twitch, give a follow. Let me know if you have any uh, ideas. If you're on YouTube, like, subscribe, give a comment with any thoughts or recommendations. Usually I'm going to be uh, reading different pieces, uh, poems, short stories. So let me know if you have any recommendations for that as well. But just remember, we're here, and we're listening.